Hot beverages like coffee and hot chocolate are big parts of our business at AMPM. Many customers look forward to a freshly brewed cup of coffee or hot chocolate when they stop into your store, especially first thing in the morning. These same customers will often buy something else to go along with their drink, a donut, a sandwich, a newspaper, especially if you do a little upselling. In this module, you'll learn about the hot beverage equipment we use. You'll also learn how to prepare the kind of great tasting hot beverages that'll keep your customers coming back for more. Now the first thing to look for are the switches and controls under this panel. The on-off switch, the brew switches, and the indicator lights. Now this red button lets the customer pour plain hot water. Now the main part of the brewing system is here in the brew basket and the urn. The coffee and filter go inside here. Now when the coffee's brewed, it's held in this urn. Some people call this a satellite server. That's because it can be removed from the hot plate and set onto the satellite warmer. That way it stays fresh and hot and the brewer's available to make more. And that's important when customers are buying a lot of coffee. Now this sight gauge helps you see how much coffee's in the urn. This urn holds three pots of coffee when full. We can make one or two pots of coffee with this machine. But always look at the gauge and make sure how much coffee is in the urn before brewing more. Now these faucets draw the coffee. These faucets are color coded, black for regular and orange for decaffeinated. Now to make coffee, we want to make sure that the unit is on. Now it should be on all the time, except for once in a while it might be turned off for cleaning. Now if it's turned off, you lift the faceplate, turn the on switch, and let it heat up for 10 minutes. The water must be at least 195 degrees. Now once it's ready, you pull out the brew basket, and you put in one filter, like this. Well, how are you two doing here? Just fine. We're about to make some coffee. You know, those filters don't look very strong. Wouldn't it be better if we used two? No, always use only one filter. If you use more than one filter, then the water can't flow through the grounds fast enough, and you'll end up with coffee that's too strong or too bitter. Now, if I was going to make one pot of coffee, I would only use one pre-measured packet. But since it's busy, and we're still selling a lot of coffee at this time of day, and I've looked at the gauge, and it shows that it's less than one-third full, I'll use two packets. You want to make sure that the coffee brews evenly. So you want to shake it. Now when things get busy, you might think that you can save yourself some time by filling up several filters with fresh coffee and letting them sit until you need them. That's a bad idea. Coffee gets stale very quickly when it's exposed to air. And stale coffee grounds make stale tasting coffee. Plus, if you stack several filters with fresh coffee on top of each other, some of the grounds from one packet will stick to the bottom of the filter that's above it. And those grounds are going to wind up in the bottom of the customer's coffee cup. You slide the brew basket back in like this, put it on a clean urn with the lid in place on the hot plate. You also want to make sure that the urn is secure and that the unit has the right color-coded faucet for the kind of coffee you're making. And to start the brewing cycle, you want to press one of the brewing switches, a half gallon for one pot and a full gallon for two pots. Now once the brewing cycle is done, you still have one more job to do. You've got to take the used grounds out of the basket. Do we have to do that right away? I mean, if we're busy, couldn't we just let it sit for a while? Not if you want our coffee to keep tasting great. Used grounds in the brew basket drip bitter oils into the coffee. And the longer the grounds sit, the more bitter the coffee gets. Yes, but make certain not to pull the basket out too soon. If there's any hot water in the basket when you take it out, it could splash and burn you. So make absolutely certain the coffee has stopped running through the basket before you take the basket out. And what do I do with the used coffee grounds? Throw them away in the trash can. Don't ever put them in a sink or drain. To make coffee, first make certain that the machine is on and is warm. It takes at least 10 minutes for it to warm up. Place one filter into the brew basket, never more. Check the sight gauge to see how full the unit is and add either one or two pre-measured packets of coffee. Then press the proper brew switch for either one pot or two. 
When the brewing is completed, dispose of the used grounds in a trash can. If you have any questions about brewing coffee, just ask your store manager. And of course, you can always check your manual. Now complete checkpoint one in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next part of this video program. Now stop the video. Now to ensure that we're always making great tasting coffee, there's two things you have to remember. Always keep the equipment clean and never use any soaps or cleansers on any part of the unit that comes in contact with the coffee. Now we're going to start by cleaning the outside of the brewing unit. But remember, it's on, so the plate will be hot and be careful. Now do you ever use anything besides water here? A cloth should be used for stainless steel and a stainless cleaner such as Pearlbrite. Now stainless has a grain finish like a pattern. Now wipe the polish in the direction of the grain, back and forth, never up and down or in circles. Now this is the only polish that should be used, never any heavy duty cleansers or chemicals. That might damage the surface, and that'd make it a lot harder to keep clean. Now sometimes, a soft brush with some warm water is needed to keep these basket rails completely clean. Use warm water and a sponge to clean the coffee oils out of the brew basket. Then you rinse it in warm water and let it dry. Never use any soaps or cleansers to clean the brew basket because it comes into direct contact with the coffee. Now the satellite server is the same. To clean it, just wipe the inside out with warm water and a cloth. And the outside with warm water and a scotch bright pad. Now this urn should be cleaned at least once a day. And never put the whole unit into a sink full of water. That could damage the insulation, and the urn wouldn't be able to keep the coffee warm. OK, I'll remember that. OK, next we'll clean the faucet and the glass gauge. And you start by unscrewing this cap, and use warm water and a stiff bristled bottle brush to clean out the inside. Now when you're cleaning this faucet, check the seat cup for any leaks or cracks. If you find any, replace it before you put it all back together. Now check with me if you need any parts. I'll show you where we keep them and how to put them back on. Now it's important to keep this glass gauge clean because customers look at it. They judge the quality of our coffee by what they see here. Now you start by unscrewing this cap Take the glass gauge out of its housing and use warm water and a bottle brush to clean the inside of the tube. And you take out the housing by turning it counterclockwise. Now remember where you put this little rubber washer so you can find it when you're ready to reassemble the unit. And these tubes are made of very delicate glass, so be careful not to break them when you clean them. For the last step, use a bottle brush to clean out the piping that leads to the satellite server. Great tasting coffee begins with clean equipment. Polish the outside of the coffee equipment with a stainless steel polish. Do not use heavy duty cleansers. Clean the brew basket and satellite server with just warm water, not soap or cleansers. Clean the faucet, glass gauge and piping with warm water and a stiff bristled bottle brush. And that's how you keep your coffee equipment clean. Now complete checkpoint two in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next segment of this video program. Now stop the video.
Some people want a different kind of hot beverage. That's where hot chocolate comes in. And making hot chocolate is easy, and it's similar to making coffee. Now, just like the coffee brewer, you want to make sure that the unit is on. Now, if it's off, flip the heater switch on and let it heat up for 10 minutes. Now, once it's ready, lift the lid, pour in one bag of cocoa mix into the hopper. Replace the lid. Now, I noticed you just poured the mix in. You didn't smooth it out or tap it down or anything. Right. If you tamp it down, the water won't mix well with it. It might clog the unit. Also, the chocolate might be lumpy or too strong. So just pour it in and let it be. Now, the water is automatically fed through the unit and heated. It's a foolproof operation. But it's a good idea to check the quality of your hot chocolate once you put in a new bag. Take a 12-ounce cup, put it under the mix chamber, Press this button until it's two-thirds full. Then when you release, it'll fill up automatically. Good, isn't it? The secret to great hot chocolate is keeping the equipment clean, just like with coffee. The main difference between the two units is that this equipment is a lot simpler to clean. Now, the hot chocolate unit has to be cleaned once a day. You can do that by first turning it off and then unplugging it. Now that lets the unit cool down and it also prevents you from getting shocked. Now while the unit's cooling down, you want to wipe it off with a clean, damp cloth. Now this dispenser also gets just as dirty as the coffee brewer. So sometimes you might have to use the stainless polish also. Okay. So what do you do next? Well, you take off the front plate by lifting up and out. Then you take off the wing nuts. Now this lets you take off the mix chamber. And just let it dangle by the lower tube. Now you want to rinse it inside and out with detergent and hot water. You want to wash these at the same time and rinse them in cold water. And make sure that you set them aside to dry. And put it all back together. And don't forget to reattach the upper tube. Now the mix chamber still has detergent in it. So you want to plug it back in. Make sure you have a container in place. And press the rinse button for 10 seconds. Now put the front plate back on. and wipe it off. And last, wash the drip tray and the splash guard. Once the unit warms up, you're all ready to make hot chocolate in a clean dispenser. Hot chocolate is much like coffee when it comes to making the product and cleaning the machine. Begin by making sure that the machine is on and is warm. Pour one bag of hot chocolate mix into the hopper, and that's it. Cleaning the unit is just as easy. Clean the outside of the unit with a damp cloth and maybe a little stainless polish. Use detergent and hot water to clean the mix chamber. Then rinse the parts in cold water and let them dry. After you have reassembled the mix chamber, run the rinse function for 10 seconds. And last, wash the drip tray and splash guard. Now complete checkpoint three in your participant's guide. 
When you finish the checkpoint, study the review sections for this module in your participant's guide. Remember, you can go over the reviews as many times as you like. See your store manager if you have any questions about this module. When you're ready, take the module test. Remember, the module test counts. Keeping our stores stocked for our customers is an important responsibility. You may be called on to replenish merchandise on the shelves from extra stock in the back room. Maintain the appearance of our merchandise by regular facing, fronting, dusting, and rotating using the date code to ensure product freshness. In some cases, you may even be called on to help accept the delivery from the vendors who service our store, although this activity is usually handled by a manager. But you need to become familiar with the simple steps we follow to ensure that all vendors are handled in a professional, business-like manner. Let's start with the seven steps to proper vendor check-in. One, all deliveries are scheduled on certain days at specific times, and we handle only one vendor at a time. Now that allows us to focus on just one vendor and keep customer inconvenience to a minimum. And we tell the vendor where to park. Second, after signing the vendor sign-in log, they pull out any outdated items and list them on a separate credit ticket. Now, we always handle the entire delivery, both ins and outs, just once, so the vendor does not remove anything from the store at this point. Third, the vendor brings the fresh products in the store and sets them up for us in a neutral area. Now, this is very important for two reasons. It's not in the way of the customers, and it's less confusing there, too. Fourth, we touch count every item. Now this makes sure that our store is getting everything it's supposed to get. We compare the invoice and delivery against the buildup book to be sure we won't run out before the next delivery day. Fifth, we verify the math, the extensions and totals, and we make sure the cost for each item is current and accurate. Now we're ready for step number six. We sign the invoice and keep the original, the top copy. And be sure not to sign the carbons. Our store could be billed incorrectly. The last step is to escort the vendor out of the store. And remember to inspect all empty boxes and cartons. Sometimes vendors have been known to help themselves to our merchandise without paying. And when the delivery is finished, there's no reason to hang around the store. And make sure they clean up after themselves, too. Now let's watch Barb show us how to receive a beer delivery. Hi, Greg. I'm glad you're here early. I have a new employee that needs to learn about receiving stock. Here's the invoice. I'll go get the last act. You better sign in first. And do all vendors have to sign in? Every time before they do anything else. Suppose there's more than one vendor at a time who signs in first. We never have two. Only one. It's a strict policy. Why? It seems like there's plenty of room out here. We may have room, but you can't handle more than one properly. If you split your attention, something may go wrong. Now why are we out here if the beer goes over there? You tell him, Greg. If we count on my merchandise where it's stock, we might lose count, uh, mix up the new with the old. Over here, we both know the count is right. I couldn't have said it clearer myself. Tell you what, while I check you in, why don't you tell Sid everything he needs to know about receiving stock? 
I've done it enough time. Bet I can call off all the points. First, vendors must park in the designated area, not to block windows or views into the store. Never come in during lunch, before 7 a.m. or after 4 p.m. In fact, it's best if you make every delivery at the same time of day, every day of the week, every week. Why? Your stores have a strict policy, one vendor at a time, and be sure to sign in as soon as you come in. Oh yeah, Barb told me about that. It seems pretty logical. It sure does. Avoids confusion, we can both concentrate on what we're doing, and I can get out of here faster. It also gives us a chance to stay current about what's on special, but you'll learn about that later soon. I understand. So what's next, Greg? I check your store for any outdated product. If I find any, I pull it. Bring it here and write up a credit ticket. Then I bring your delivery to a neutral location where you touch count it. We touch count everything, Sid. And while we're doing that, we spot check for the expiration date to make sure that everything's fresh and not mixed in with the old. And check everything on the invoice and then check the math. And multiply the number of units by the cost of each unit. And that should give you the same figure as Greg has written down here. And make sure it adds up right. Then you sign the invoice, keep the original, and give the vendor the copy. That's almost right. Almost? almost. Barb forgot to tell you not to give me the copy and let me go until I cleaned up any mess I've made. I was going to tell him that later. Hey, well, thanks for the lesson, Greg. I'm sure Barb appreciates not having to teach me everything. Anytime. Enjoyed it. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Now, did he tell me everything? Not quite. He forgot a few important points. Now, it doesn't apply in Greg's case, but usually you have to make sure that you flatten or inspect all the cartons before the vendor leaves. He could take merchandise out in them by mistake or otherwise. There are seven steps you should follow in vendor management. One, schedule all deliveries. When vendors arrive, have them sign in. Two, have vendors check their stock for outdated product and remove it. This should then be listed on a separate credit slip. Three, have the product brought to a neutral location. Four, touch count everything. Five, Verify all figures and math on the invoice. Six, sign the invoice, keeping the top copy the original. And seven, have the vendor clean up any mess before you escort him from the store. That is very important. Not everyone's honest, and an unwatched vendor could do all sorts of things. Swap old merchandise for fresh, cheat us on the count, or even walk away with half the store. You have to watch them closely. I was over there at the counter and heard Barb and Greg cover just about everything, all except one very important policy. Never ask for samples or accept free merchandise. We are businessmen, and so are our vendors. Keep it that way. If you ever have any questions about receiving vendor deliveries, check with your store manager. Now complete checkpoint one in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, View the next part of this video program. Now stop the video. Now we're always looking to use all the space available so that we can put the merchandise right on the shelf. Now why are you pricing on the bottom? That's hard to see. It's also hard to damage or rip off. The shelf tag tells the price. Oh, so that's what you use as the price. Never. Always look in the price book for the right price. Now use the book price, and if there are items on the shelf that are not at that price, reprice them too. Also, always put new merchandise to the rear. And see this? Damaged goods, no one will buy this. Remove this from the shelf and put it in the storeroom so we can get a refund from the vendor. Also, never mix it with back stock. There's room back there for damaged goods. 
Now I notice you're putting all the boxes face up. That's called facing the stock. We want to do it every chance we get, usually during stocking. Now, facing the stock sells better, it looks good, and it's easy to find. Is that a price gun? Easy to use? Simple. Here, I'll show you how. Pull out the style to the indicator is on the digit you want to change. You can set numbers, dollar or cent signs, a decimal point, and if you need it, even a tax symbol. Make your changes, then push the knob back in and lock it. I can do that. Let me hit a few prices. All righty. I'll let you do a few. That's it. When you're done here, come in the cooler. Okay. Hi, Barb. I'm all done out there. What are we doing in here? Quite a bit. Now, no matter how cold it gets in here, never turn these fans off. The compressor could be badly damaged, and if you should forget to turn the fans back on, everything in here might spoil. We're talking major money. So don't fool with the switches. Now I'm rotating the stock. Always remember, new stuff on the bottom is the old. Old stuff on the top. We sell this first. You notice that the beer stacks are in front of the beer doors, soda in front of the soda doors, and the milk in front of its door. Now all the faster moving products we put towards the front for easy access. Always keep at least two to three inches of space away from the wall and use these boards to keep the stacks up off the floor. Yeah, very tidy. It also saves time in stocking. Now, when you're stocking the doors, it's the same as stocking the gondolas. New stuff at the rear and everything faced to the front. You know, Barb, it looks like we have room for another row of Miller Lite here. No, we don't. That's something I forgot to tell you when we were restocking the gondolas. Look at the shelf tag. It says Miller Longs. Well, I don't see any Miller Longs in here. Right, so keep it open until we get some. Don't put things where they don't belong. Mm, I'm getting kind of cold. Can we get out of here now? We have one more job to do. We have to rebuild a few six packs of beer. Many customers just grab one or two beers from the full six pack. So we need to rebuild them. Nice, neat, and saleable. Exactly. So what's next? Well, there's two areas left, promotional displays and the sales counter. Now always keep a sharp eye on the displays. Make sure that they're neat and full and that the right price sign is on them. And never use a vendor's rack to hold different product. Now the same is true for the baskets around the sales counter. Each has a sign and should always be kept full. They're great for impulse sales. Now finally, the sales counter. Everything has its own space and should be kept full. Each of these rows holds 14 packs of cigarettes. Keep your eye on them, and when there's four left, refill them. That way, they will hold an entire carton. Now you're ready for impulse sales. Impulse sales? Let me take over from here, Barb. It's very simple, and it really relates to stocking the store. You see, a customer comes in and finds what he wants easily because the stock is full when faced correctly. Then a display, full and inviting, catches his eye, and he buys that too. And then we help them along with a little upselling at the register. Now that's why we insist that all of the stock at the sales counter is full and fresh. That's the best area for added sales. So in stocking, I should probably concentrate there. Well, I want the whole store stocked. But if I had to tell you what to do first, it would be the fast food area. Then the cooler doors, particularly the soda and the beer. Then the candy section. And lastly, the gondolas. Concentrate on everything, but particularly the areas where we do the most business. Huh. I knew that just putting up the groceries sounded too easy, but it all comes together now. When pricing merchandise, always use the price book. Place all new merchandise at the rear. While stocking the shelves, remove any damaged merchandise. Make sure all items are properly faced and fronted on the shelves. Always clean and dust everything. Check the shelf tags so that product is placed where it is supposed to be. If needed, rebuild the displays and make certain that the proper prices, signs and racks are used with the right product.
While you cannot overlook any section in the store, give your highest priority to maintaining the fast food area. Now complete checkpoint two in your participants guide. When you finish the checkpoint, study the review sections for this module in your participants guide. Keep in mind that you can go over the reviews as often as you feel may be necessary. See your store manager if you have any questions about this module. When you're ready, you can take the module test. Remember, the module test counts. Now stop the video. So, what's Barb teaching you today, Jeff? How to cook and store these hot foods. There's a lot to learn. Proper thawing, cooking, fast wrapping, proper product display, when to cook and how much to cook. When to cook and how much. That's right. All of our fast food must be kept hot and fresh. And if we cook too much all at once, it can get cold before we get it into the warmer. And if we don't sell it quickly, it can dry out. Right. There's two basic rules to fast food cook less more often, and keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Now, every step of food preparation is important. We want to serve our customer the highest quality food. And quality begins right here, Jeff. All of our hot food is delivered to us frozen, so we have to get into the freezer immediately. Now, we keep everything below zero degrees Fahrenheit, or we put it into the walk-in if we're going to be using it in the next few days. Now, it's important to date and rotate all the food as we fill the freezer. That way we use the older food first. This is gonna be pretty full. Should I put some in the ice merchandiser? Never. We have to keep everything below zero degrees Fahrenheit until we thaw it, or in the case of the cookies or potatoes, until we cook them. The ice merchandiser isn't cold enough. It's about 20 degrees. So it all stays here. Right, except what we'll be using in the next few days. We rotate the supplies, too. We want to make sure that we use the older stock first. OK. Now, what if we run out of thawed food? Can we just put frozen food under hot water or something? No. If you use the build-up sheet, you won't run out. Now, let's make some burgers. You grab some, and I'll go warm up the oven. OK. We use this convection oven to prepare all our hot food. And first, we turn it on and set it to 325 degrees. And that's the temperature we use for everything except cookies. Now, this amber light will go off when the oven is preheated to 325 degrees and ready to cook. Then turn on the bun toaster. It takes at least 20 minutes for both the toaster and the oven to preheat. What do we do while we wait? We've already washed our hands, so now we get the patties and the buns ready. Now, don't open these patty packages. Next, look at the cooking chart to make sure that you have the right time for each item. We can only cook 18 items at once, depending on how they're packaged. You might only be able to cook two or three trays simultaneously. Now, we only need one tray of quarter pounders, so they go on the middle rack. Now, if we needed two, they would go on the top and the bottom. And if we were cooking three, we would use the top, bottom, and the middle. 
why only 18 items? Because we can't wrap more than 18 fast enough to get them in the warmer while they're still hot. Remember, keep hot things hot, and if we're cooking different products at the same time, burgers, burritos, or egg rolls, we have to check the chart. The light went out, so should I put the burgers in and start toasting buns? Set the timer, put the burgers in, and then push the start button. Now, we don't toast the buns until two minutes before the burgers are ready to come out. If we're cooking two or three trays of patties, start three or four minutes before they're done. Okay, it says two minutes now. Good. Now turn the toaster motor on, and remember, always wear gloves when preparing food. Open the package of buns, separate the halves, and feed them into the toaster. And make sure that the insides are facing you, with the tops on the right and the bottoms on the left. What setting is the toaster on? That varies, usually between 8 and 10. Check the buns against the pictures on the wall chart. And when the timer goes off, put the oven mitt on and remove the burgers. Now probe a burger with a clean, sanitized thermometer. It should read at least 165 degrees. Now if it's less, cook them for another minute and probe them again. Notice that I laid out six bottoms here as soon as they came out of the toaster. Don't forget, quarter pounders are cheeseburgers. Put a full slice on each bottom to get ready for the patty. Once the burgers come out of the oven, there's no time to lose or they'll cool off. I know. Keep the hot things hot. Put the tops on and wrap. Center the burger, fold the wrap up from the bottom and down from the top, and the corners in to make triangles on each side. Lift it up and tuck the triangles underneath. After wrapping all hot food, always time stamp the food before placing it in the warmer. Then get them all in the warmer quickly, adding this new food to the rear. It's very important not to lose any time. Remember, the warmer is a merchandiser, not an oven. Properly set, it will keep the food 140 degrees or hotter, but it won't heat up food that's cooled off. Food in the warmer must be above 140 degrees. That's a health department requirement. If we don't put them in there quickly, or if we forget to close the back doors, they will cool off. Can't we just turn up the temperature on the warmer? It's adjustable, and you have to keep checking it. But if we turn it up too high, the food will dry out. Just get the food in the warmer quickly. Then probe a sampling of food with a sanitized thermometer every hour or so to check the warmer setting. That way, we can be sure the burgers are right when they're sold. There are different wraps for each sandwich. They all go on the same bun, and each sandwich has its own cooking time listed on the wall chart. Remember, check the chart and change the cooking time for each sandwich. But the oven stays at 325 degrees for everything, except cookies. The only other product that uses the toaster is the breakfast sandwich. While the breakfast products are cooking in the oven, toast the English muffins. Use the left side of the toaster only for both halves. Start three minutes before the oven timer goes off. Then arrange them on the trays. Put a slice of cheese on each one. Use the tongs to put the food on. Use their own special wraps. Work fast, they'll cool off quickly, and get them in the warmer quickly. Every time you cook, take the temperature of the first product you pull from the oven. If the food is not at 165 degrees, put it back in the oven for another minute and check again. The two most important rules in fast food are cook less more often, and keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Date and rotate the stock in the freezer and the cooler so that you use the older food first. All AM PM sandwiches are to be cooked in an oven at 325 degrees. Cook no more than 18 items at any one time so you can wrap and get them into the warmer before they cool. Cook the product in the sealed packages they come in. Sanitation is very important in preparing foods. 
Always wear gloves when you are handling food. Food is not properly cooked until it reaches at least 165 degrees. Probe it with a sanitized thermometer to make sure it is ready. Always use tongs to move the food onto the buns. Check the temperature of the food in the warmer every hour. It must be at least 140 degrees. If it is not, remove the product immediately. So far, we've covered cooking packaged items that are prepared at 325 degrees Fahrenheit and have toasted buns. Let's take a moment to review. Complete checkpoint one in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next part of this video program. Now stop the video. We don't toast hot dog buns, do we? No, but we get the buns ready to save time in wrapping. While the hot dogs are cooking, we lay out the right number of boats, open the buns, and put them in the boats. Get the bags ready, place the bun and the boat part way into the bag. It makes it faster to wrap the dogs when they're done. When the timer goes off, probe one dog to make sure it's 165 degrees. Use the mittens to take the rack out. Then use the tongs to put them in the bun. Quickly put each one in the bag. Fold the open end over twice and crease it to seal. Then rush them to the warmer. I don't see any wraps for burritos or chimichangas. That's because each burrito or chimichanga comes in its own wrap, which identifies the variety. They go into the oven in those wraps. And once they're cooked, we just add these colored holders and put them in the warmer. And what about the egg rolls? After they're done, and remember to probe one first, put two egg rolls in one holder we used for the wedge cut potatoes. Add a packet of mustard and a packet of plum sauce, and they're ready for the warmer. Can I cook different things together? Yes, you can cook anything together as long as the cooking times are the same. What about different times? Only two different times. We can cook a maximum of two different foods with different cooking times. But there must be at least three minutes difference between the times. That leaves enough time to get the first ones into the warmer before the second one is done. We put the tray that needs the most time on the top shelf and the shorter one on the bottom shelf. Set the timer for the shorter time, and when that's done, take it out and set the timer for the remaining time. The two most important rules in fast food are cook less more often and keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Hot dogs, burritos, and egg rolls are always, in fact, cooked at 325 degrees. While the hot dogs are cooking, prepare the right number of buns, boats, and bags to make it faster to wrap when the product is cooked. Probe one hot dog with a sanitized thermometer to make sure it's at least 165 degrees after cooking. If it's not, cook it some more. Always place product in the warmer quickly after wrapping. Do not cook more than two different foods together with two different cooking times. Also, there must be at least three minutes difference between the two cooking times. Finally, don't forget to look at your cooking chart and follow the instructions carefully. That covers preparing bulk packed fast food items cooked at 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's review what you've learned so far. Complete checkpoint two in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next segment in this video program. Now stop the video. We've covered all our hot food except for the pizza and the cookies. And since we have the oven at 325 degrees, Let's do the pizza first. The cookies need a cooler oven temperature. And some stores may have a small pizza oven under the convection oven to cook the pizza. But the way you cook the pizza is the same. 
we remove the wrapping and the cardboard from the thawed pizza and use the pizza peel to put the pizza in the convection oven. Then we put a pan on the shelf below the pizza. That'll catch any cheese that runs off. Check the chart, set the timer, and hit start. While it cooks, make up these pizza trays. We'll need eight per pizza. Fold these flaps up and over all the way. That makes the sides stay up. When it's done, put the pizza on the plastic cutting guide, print side down, and use the pizza cutter to make eight slices. For pepperoni pizza slices, we add three pieces of pepperoni to each slice. Put each slice in a tray, then put six slices on the serving pan, making sure that the tabs are sticking out for easy pickup. Then put them in the warmer, pepperoni on the top shelf, supreme combination on the bottom shelf. What goes on the middle shelf? That's where you put the pan of extra slices. Remember, we cut each pizza into eight slices and we put six slices on each tray. There, all done. Now I'm going to turn the oven down to 275 degrees so we can bake some cookies later. But right now, why don't I show you how to run the pizza warmer? The pizza warmer and the food warmer are both just heated cabinets. Properly used, they keep our food above 140 degrees until served. Both of them have variable controls, which you have to set to maintain the product temperature. Now, to make sure that the food doesn't get over 155 degrees, if it does, it'll dry out and it won't last as long. And start the pizza warmer with a high temperature setting and a low humidity setting. That will keep moisture from forming on the glass. Now preheat this unit for at least 20 minutes before putting the pizza in. Now when the temperature reads between 165 and 170 degrees, turn the humidity control to halfway between medium and high. You need that much humidity to keep the pizza from drying out. Now, don't depend on the thermometer that's built into the unit. Hang an oven thermometer from the bar that holds the middle pan. It should read 150 degrees. Now, when it's in operation, the pizza warmer will use about three quarts of water a day. When it's full, the green light will go on for about 30 minutes. Now, if the red light goes on, the unit needs water. Fill it with distilled water until the red light goes off and the green light goes on. Now be careful not to overfill it. And all of these instructions are on the back of the pizza warmer. Where are the lights on the Merco warmer? It doesn't have any. It's not humidity controlled. So it's real easy. Just turn it on and leave it alone. Wrong. You must check what's happening in the Merco and the pizza warmer at least three times a day. And more often is better. We put quality food in and it can get ruined if you don't watch it. That's why we have thermometers installed. Why do we need to keep checking the warmer? Warmer temperatures will change with the amount of food we put in, the temperature the food was at when it went in, and the amount of time that the doors are open. And we fill products from the rear. Now each item has a label showing its place in the warmer. We call this system the warmer planogram. It tells us how to display the products. Now, we may change the plan from day to day or even hour to hour as one product sells faster than the other. The point is, you should always follow the plan so customers can find products easily. The two most important rules in fast food are cook less more often and keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Pizza is cooked at a temperature of 325 degrees. Use the plastic cutting guide to cut eight slices per pizza. Then place each slice on a tray, and with the tab sticking out, put six slices on a pan. Check the Mirko and pizza warmer temperatures frequently. Keep the temperature of the pizza warmer at 150 degrees. Proper humidity is important to serving good pizza. Add distilled water when the red indicator light goes on. Follow the warmer planogram in displaying the pizza so that customers can easily find the product they want. Before we cover cookies, let's review how to prepare pizza and the pizza warmer. 
Complete checkpoint three in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next segment of this video program. Now stop the video. Now the oven should be cooled down by now, ready to bake some cookies. Now the oven is now set at 275 degrees, and that's the right temperature for all the cookies, except the only thing you need to change is the timer setting for different cookies. Now you look up on the wall chart for that too. Now be careful not to mix varieties that need different cooking times on the same oven tray. First, put this special cooking paper on that tray. That keeps them from sticking. Then lay out the frozen dough. Spacing is important. We do not want flat tires caused by spacing cookies too close to each other. One pan will hold 12. We can make up to 36 cookies at a time using only the top, bottom, and middle racks of the oven. I'll set the timer and get this batch cooking while you put the rest of the dough back in the freezer. Quality control, right? Always remember our motto, keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Now these are done, but you have to let them sit in the pan for 15 minutes before you put them out. Now remember, when you display them, you always want to put the fresh cookies in the rear. Well, that's all you need to know to be a great AM PM cook. Now all you need is a little practice. The two most important rules in fast food are cook less more often, and keep hot things hot and cold things cold. Unlike anything else, cookies are cooked at 275 degrees. Cooking times vary for different cookies. Follow the cooking chart for the proper time for the cookies you are making. Place cooking paper on the trays to prevent the cookies from sticking. Never thaw out the dough ahead of time. Lay out frozen dough. Evenly space 12 cookies on each tray. Once the cookies are removed from the oven, let them sit on the pan for 15 minutes to let them cool off before putting them out to display. Remember, cookies are the only product we cook at 275 degrees Fahrenheit, and they must be done while they're frozen. Be sure you let them cool down on the rack for 15 minutes before displaying them. It's time now to stop the video and complete the checkpoint in your participant's guide. When you finish the checkpoint, study the review sections for this module in your participant's guide. Remember, you can go over the reviews as often as you like. When you're ready, you can take the module test. And remember, the module test counts. Safety and security are important issues for every AM PM. Let's begin by making a safety inspection of the facility and we'll look at some potential safety hazards. 
Let's start our inspection at the gas pumps. All right, now what we're looking for here is any sign of a leak or any condition that might be a potential hazard. Here on the driveway, I had noticed uh, what looks to be either an oil spot or probably a small gasoline spill. Why is that a problem? Well, any spill is uh, potentially dangerous because uh, it makes the pavement slick and it's a potential fire hazard as well. First thing we need to do is block off the area with uh, the emergency cones. All right, and then we'll sprinkle the absorbent. Now you want the maximum thickness to be a quarter of an inch on the absorbent. And we'll let it soak up the spill. Okay, now we'll use a broom to move the absorbent around a little bit. That way it gets the maximum absorption. Okay, we'll go ahead and sweep it up. And we'll put it in this bag. The stuff's now contaminated, so we always keep it separate from the trash. And then the manager arranges for disposal. Okay, wet down the area, and then you can sprinkle it with detergent. All right, now we'll uh, scrub it with the stiff bristle broom. Okay. Okay, we rinse the area with a water broom. That's right, then we dry it with the island squeegee. There. All right, now the pavement is clean and safe. You can clean up small spills that way, but larger spills call for emergency action. If you have a gasoline spill of five gallons or more, call the fire department or 911. And don't wait, call them immediately. It's all explained in the business emergency response plan found in the plastic yellow box under the Arcomatic. How does a big spill happen? Well, say for example at a delivery or perhaps a pump equipment malfunction, then you could really have a big spill in your hands. Obviously the more gasoline you have spilled, the more dangerous the situation. But a really big spill, that's a serious emergency. And you should call the fire department or dial the 911 emergency number immediately. But there's more you need to do. You need to shut off the underground pumps. You do that by throwing the emergency pump switch or the pump switch is located in the electrical panel. If you ever have to deal with a gasoline spill, just remember that the last thing you want to do is spread that spill any farther, so don't try to wash it away with water. You know, all this talk about safety has got me thinking about something else. What if there really is a fire? What should I do? Well, you act fast. The first thing you do is throw the emergency pump switch and the emergency switches in the switch box to prevent the flow of gasoline from the underground tanks. Can't we just turn the pump switch off at the cash register? No, absolutely not. That switch only shuts down the hoses, not the submerged pumps. The danger would still be there. You have to shut down the submerged pumps. OK. Now, once the pumps are shut down, you call the fire department, and then you call the manager right away to let him or her know just exactly what's happened. Isn't there anything else we could do ourselves, say if there's a small car fire or something? Oh, sure there is. The portable fire extinguishers, we keep in good working order and charge for a situation just like that. OK, but you said to shut down the pumps. How do you do that? Well, like Jack said, that's done with the emergency switch and the electrical panel in the back. For right now, let's go ahead and complete the pump inspection area. We'll show you that in just a moment. Another thing you need to do, check the hoses often for any sign of a leak. OK, if you do find a leak, the pump cannot be used until it's replaced or repaired. Also, check the hose retractor. Make sure that the hose is in its proper position. Now, this is uh, just exactly how it's supposed to look. Now, if a nozzle should develop a problem, the pump needs to be taken out of service, tagged, and locked until it can be repaired. And always let the manager know right away whenever there's a malfunction of any of the gas pumping equipment. I noticed this. Uh, it shouldn't be lying around here. Someone must have forgotten it. OK, 
can you pump gas into that? Oh, sure. This is an approved container for gasoline. However, if it weren't, though, by law, it must not be filled. Say if a customer comes into the store with a non-approved container, say a milk jug or a bucket, a, a glass jar, something like that, you cannot activate the gas pump, OK? All right. All right, pump area looks just fine. Let's go take a look at the emergency switch and the electrical panel. It's over here. Now, here's the emergency switch we've been talking about. Tripping this switch shuts down the underground turbine pumps, which you might need to do in case of an emergency when gas is leaking. I see. But wouldn't it be quicker to use the emergency shutoff switch on the cash register? Only if you just want to shut off the dispensers, but the turbines would still be live. You see, the register switch doesn't shut off the submerged pumps. To shut them off, you have to use either this emergency pump switch or the pump switches in the electrical panel box. Bob, why don't you show him those now? OK. Come on. OK, this is the electrical panel. The individual pump switches are here. But let's talk about safety first. Now, we always keep the area around the panel board clean and free of any stock or equipment. And never, never use any tools of any kind around the electrical panel. Now, all the switches are labeled. These marked in red are the ones that need to be turned off in any emergency. Along with these switches on the sides of the red boxes. OK? And the switches marked in white are the ones that need to be turned on at dusk and off at dawn. OK, let's see. Now, the pump switches are to shut down the submerged pumps. Mm -hmm. Red marking means to turn off in an emergency, along with these over here. Right. OK. And the white means turn on at dusk and off at dawn. That's right. OK, now the next item in our inspection should be the fire extinguishers. You'll find them located at the front door and also in the back room. And next is the exit doors. The exit doors are very important because they're used for escape in any emergency. And when seconds count, if there's an obstacle or an obstruction, it could cost someone's life in a fire. Spills on the pavement present a hazard and must be cleaned up immediately. For small spills, block off the area with cones and sprinkle absorbent. Once it soaks up the spill, the absorbent is contaminated and must be disposed of properly. When it is removed, scrub the area with detergent, rinse, and then dry. For a big spill, five gallons or more, quickly shut off the underground pumps by throwing the emergency switches in the electrical panel. Then notify the fire department and also call your manager and never attempt to wash away the spill with water. In the event of a fire, act immediately Shut off the emergency switches at the electrical panel. Call the fire department or 911. It's a real emergency. Then notify the manager immediately. Remember the difference in the switches of the electrical panel. The red ones are only thrown in the event of an emergency, while the white ones are turned on at dusk each day. If you have any questions about the gasoline dispensers, exterior safety, or the electric panels, make sure to ask your manager right away. Now complete checkpoint one in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next part of this program. Now stop the video. Now let's look at some general housekeeping procedures that are important for safety reasons. Right. And you see, you should always keep the floor clean and clear. Anything on the floor is a hazard. This mop is even a hazard. Maintenance items like these need to be stored properly and carefully. And you should always use these wet floor cones whenever you mop. Now wouldn't it be better to wait until no one was here before you mop the floor? Well, only for general cleaning. But if something is spilled, it's already a hazard. The best time to clean it up is right away. All right, let's show you the storage room. Now, everything here should be stored neatly so we know where it is and accidents don't happen. 
A tall stack of boxes could be trouble. If it's not balanced and it falls, it could hurt someone. Notice that this shelf is reserved for hazardous chemicals, like insecticides. Now, we don't keep food anywhere near here. The chemicals are on a low shelf, so there's less chance of their falling into any other container. We also keep anything combustible here, away from lights, water heaters, warmers, ovens, or any other heat sources. Now, heavy items are always on lower shelves. The less distance they fall, the less damage they can do. Just as with the outside, spills and hazards on the floor inside are to be cleaned up immediately. Keep the storage areas neat and free of clutter, and never store food near any hazardous chemicals or combustible material near a source of heat that could cause fire. Now complete checkpoint two in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next segment of this video. Now stop the video. Lifting can put a terrific strain on your back. You can actually injure yourself with a relatively light weight unless you lift it using your leg muscles to take the weight. First, make sure of your footing. Don't take chances lifting if you're standing on a slippery surface. Next, take your time and get a firm grip on the object you want to lift. Keep your back straight. Bend your knees to get down to the level you're lifting from. Hold the load close to your body. Don't twist or turn while you're lifting. Never lift heavy objects above your waist level. And keep in mind, you have to know your own capability. Never lift anything that feels too heavy to you. If you need help, get it. Finally, let's look at a couple of ways you can protect yourself from injury by wearing the proper clothing. Now, this stuff can cause serious burns, so you don't want to take any chances. Always protect yourself. Protect your eyes by wearing goggles to protect yourself from dangerous chemicals. Also, rubber gloves to protect your hands. And you can use an oven mitt to protect yourself from hot items. And don't risk injuring your feet. Wear solid shoes with closed toes. Socks and stockings will give you additional protection. Your safety and the safety of others is the highest priority at AMPM. So take your time, think about what you're doing, and keep your store a safe and healthful place. There is a technique to lifting properly. Follow it to avoid injury. Start by making sure you have a solid footing. Next, get a firm grip on the object. Keep your back straight, don't hunch over. Bend at the knees and draw the load close to your body. When you are carrying the load, do not twist at the waist or raise a heavy load above the waist. Get some help. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, so let's stop here and see how well you're getting all this. Stop the video and review checkpoint three in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next segment of this video program. Now stop the video. Now, security starts outside. No one is allowed to loiter on our premises. The friends, customers, anyone who isn't here to do business with the store. But how do you know when to tell other people to leave? I mean, what do you say to them? Well, you have to be polite, but firm. For example, a couple of days ago, there was this guy out at the Pump Island. Excuse me, you're trespassing. You can't sell your flowers here. Well, I didn't hurt nobody. I, I'm sorry, but you're trespassing. You're interfering with our business. If you don't leave immediately, I'm going to have to call the police. You serious? Yes, I'm very serious. If you don't leave right now, I am required to call the police. That's our policy here. Thanks, man. Thanks. He wasn't happy, but he left. Yeah, but what would you do if he hadn't left? Well, then I would have called the police, told them I would sign a trespassing complaint. All you can do is ask someone to leave while keeping a safe distance. And that's usually all it takes. But if they don't, then call the police. And the important thing to remember is not to get involved in an argument. There's nothing to be gained by losing your temper or letting yourself get upset. Just keep a safe distance away, tell them to leave, and if they don't, call the police. But don't use 911, it's not an emergency. Okay, well, what number should I call? 
Well, there's a list of telephone numbers posted on the phone. In a real emergency, don't waste time. You should call directly for the help you need, and then call the manager or store owner. In other words, if there's a fire, call the fire department. If you need the police, call them directly. Remember, loitering is not allowed anywhere on the premises. Loiter is a trouble for you and your customers. Tell them to leave, but don't get into any argument about it. If necessary, call the police and have them arrested for trespassing. Now complete checkpoint four in your participant's guide. When you complete this assignment, view the next part of this video program. Now stop the video. We've been talking about general security matters. While most of the crime you'll see will be shoplifting, there are several things you can do to reduce the chances of a robber picking out our store. Now, one of the biggest risks a robber runs is being observed by a witness who could call for help or identify him later. A simple deterrent is to keep the inside of the store as visible as possible. Visibility increases the chances that a robber would be observed from the outside exactly what the robber fears. Especially since the observers might be the police. So make sure anyone outside can see what's happening inside. The better lit the place is, the better you can see. Now we make sure that the facility is well lit at night, both inside and out. This helps our customers feel safer and more welcome. Two other things make a store more or less vulnerable to robbery. How much money the robber can get and how big a risk he has to take. Let's start with the first factor, how much money. Our policy is to keep as little cash as possible in the drawer. Now let's review our cash handling procedure. The first step is controlling the money that comes in and goes out of the drawer. And that's what the Archimatic is for. Between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m., cash in the register should never be more than $150. After 9 p.m., there should never be more than $100 in the register. Now what if a lot of business comes in and the amount in the drawer goes over the limit? Well, the Archimatic keeps track of your cash drawer. When you exceed the limit, the display will read, Make Safe Drop. Now, as soon as you see that, finish the sale, press Safe Drop, and then put the money in the next numbered envelope and drop it. And what if I need change? We have a change fund that has some extra coins. Now, remember, the cash handling procedures are not just there to protect the cash. They protect you and the other employees and customers by making us a poor target for robbery. But how do the robbers know that we don't have much cash? They know it's our company policy. No AM, PM store should ever have more cash than that on hand. We even post signs where everyone can see them. Signs that say we have low cash available and that the safe can't be opened. Yeah, that makes sense, but what if there really is a robbery? Well, there's one primary rule. Cooperate. Cooperate. Don't do anything that will endanger yourself or anyone else. That's right. Whatever the robber may get, it's not worth anyone getting injured. Now, during the robbery, there are simple rules to follow. The first thing to remember is do not move or do anything until the robber tells you to. Remember, he's probably more nervous than you are. And when he tells you to do something, like get the money out of the cash drawer, do it. Don't argue or even talk. Just answer any questions he may ask and always keep your hands in plain sight. You don't want him thinking you're going for a gun or an alarm. Now, you shouldn't make any sudden moves. Give him exactly what he asks for. Don't stare at the robber, it'll only make him nervous. And when he has the money, let him leave quickly and quietly. Never try to stop him or chase him. But once he's gone, lock the front door and call the police. Keep the customers in the store so that the police can question them later. Now, after calling the police, call me. I must know as soon as possible about any robbery. While you're waiting for the police to arrive, begin to fill out the robbery ID form. It'll help you remember important details that you might forget later. And finally, don't talk to anyone until the police get to the store. A lot of nervous chatter about what happened can only help confuse your memory of the events. Well, do you think you can remember this? Well, the idea of robbery still scares me, but I think I can get through it. Well, that about does it for the safety and security module. Most of the points we've covered are nothing more than common sense, but that doesn't diminish their importance. 
follow the steps you've learned and you'll greatly reduce the possibility of getting hurt on the job. You can help prevent a robbery by following a few simple policies. Always keep the inside of the store as visible as possible. Keep signs from blocking the view of the register area. Make certain that the store is well lit, both inside and out. Never keep more than $150 between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. At night, you should never have more than $100 in the drawer. And always make a safe drop when instructed by the Arcomatic. In the event of a robbery, don't move until instructed to do so. Do exactly as told. Don't talk to the robber, just answer his questions. Keep your hands in plain sight. Don't make any sudden moves. Be observant, but don't stare. Let the robber leave quietly. Lock the front door immediately. Call the police. Call the manager. Complete the robbery ID form. Don't talk to anyone until the police arrive. And remember the key word, cooperate. Now complete checkpoint five in your participant's guide. When you finish the checkpoint, study the review sections for this module in your participant's guide. And keep in mind that you can go over the reviews as often as you feel may be necessary. See your store manager if you have any questions about this module. When you're ready, you can take the module test. And remember, the module test counts. Now stop the video. We have a license to sell beer and wine, and we keep that license by obeying the law. Selling alcohol isn't a right, it's a privilege, and with that privilege goes responsibilities. In this video, you'll learn what your responsibilities are under the law. You'll also learn what happens if you don't comply with the law. Let's talk about how alcohol affects the body, how it makes a person intoxicated. For starters, let's follow the path of alcohol when it's consumed. It moves quickly from the stomach through the liver into the bloodstream and finally to the person's brain. The alcohol in the bloodstream is called the blood alcohol level. This figure is used to determine who is or isn't legally intoxicated. Upon reaching the brain, it can create a feeling of happiness, confidence, and relaxation. And people that use alcohol responsibly find a beer or a glass of wine one of life's little pleasures. It's the people that cannot or will not use alcohol in a responsible manner that should concern every one of us. Alcohol in excess can have an adverse effect on such things as your vision, speech, judgment, and your coordination, which includes just about everything you need to safely drive a car. Now, first of all, you have to be at least 21 in order to ring up a beer or wine sale. Well, I'm over 21. Great, but if you weren't, you'd have to call on another employee who's on the premises who is over 21 to ring up the sale for you. And I don't sell to anyone who's under 21, right? That's right. But you always have to check the ID to be sure. Uh, if a customer looks as though he or she might be under age 25, go ahead and check the ID. Wait a minute. If, if 21 is a legal age to buy alcohol, then why should I check everyone under the age of 25? Well, actually, it's a safeguard. It's not always that easy to tell. If someone is uh, 19, 20, 21, if you use the age of 25, you'll usually be pretty safe in asking for the ID. Another thing you want to do is examine each ID very carefully. Uh, there's several things to look out for there. Uh, does the photo on the ID match the person, first of all? Uh, secondly, is uh, the photo kind of dark, maybe a little bit too fuzzy? 
What might a bad picture mean? Well, it could mean that the picture's been changed. Um, like I said, there's several things to look out for. Bumps or splits on the plastic covering the license. That's one sign of an altered ID. Uh, another thing you can watch out for are numbers that don't quite line up. Smudges uh, that might indicate someone's been trying to change or erase some information. Now, obviously, a person must be 21, but they also must be sober in order to purchase alcohol because we don't sell alcohol or gasoline to anyone who's obviously intoxicated. Time out. Tell me what is obviously intoxicated. Well, while we're not into sobriety testing, there are a few things to look out for. Uh, first of all, do you smell liquor on the customer's breath? Uh, secondly, how, uh, how steady is the customer when they're walking around the store, when they're at the, at the counter? Uh, how do they do at counting their money when they're making a purchase? Several things, bloodshot eyes, aggressive behavior. Now, these things aren't proof positive, but they can give you a pretty good idea of the customer's condition. Uh, if you're in doubt, just don't make the sale. It's, it's really not worth it. Another thing that I do want to mention here, if a customer is buying other things along with the alcohol, always check the ID first before you ring up any part of the sale. Oh, I thought I might ring up the other items first, and then when I get to the alcohol, I'll ask for ID. Well, no, you really don't want to do that, and there's several reasons why. Uh, first of all, uh, you might forget, which is dangerous. Uh, secondly, if you decide for any reason that you can't make the sale, then you won't have rung anything up already. And what if there's something wrong with the person's ID? What if you suspect that the person's not 21? Then, you know, you might be in the middle of an order and things can get really complicated. Okay, so if I spot alcohol as part of the order, I always handle the alcohol first. That's right. There's a lot to this, huh? <laughs> That's right, you bet. Uh, you know that alcohol sales account for 20% of all of our total food sales. And by the time you add related items, uh, chips, dip, picnic supplies, that sort mm -hmm. of thing, it accounts for a big part of our business. Now, alcohol sales are important, but it's also important that we handle them responsibly. Okay. Now, let's talk about second party sales. That's when one person buys alcohol for another person. Now, the person doing the buying may be okay. The ID checks out and the buyer is not intoxicated. However, that buyer may be purchasing alcohol for someone who isn't 21. Now, you wanna watch out for kids hanging out outside. If you see them approach an adult, hand him some money who then comes in the store and buys alcohol, well, there's a possibility that the buyer will give that alcohol to those kids. Now if that happens, you, the seller, are responsible. Knowing and obeying the law is vitally important in selling alcoholic beverages. Remember these key points. You must be at least 21 years old to ring up an alcohol sale. You must check the ID of any alcohol customer that looks under 25. When examining that ID, make sure it matches the person carrying it. Also, see if it has been altered in any way. You must never sell alcohol or gasoline to anyone who is obviously intoxicated. You need to use your best judgment here, so be observant of the customer's physical condition and actions. Whenever alcohol is part of a mixed order of products, check the ID first before ringing up anything. Finally, be on the lookout for second party alcohol sales. Remember, you are responsible. This might be a good point to stop and complete checkpoint one in your participant's guide. After you complete this assignment, view the next part of this video program. Now, stop the video. To this point, you've been learning about the why of alcohol sales. It's time to turn our attention to the how of alcohol sales. Sure, that all sounds reasonable, but I've got a question. Shoot. Maybe it's me, but I've got to believe that refusing to sell someone a six pack or a bottle of wine could cause a hassle. Well, sure, it could result in a hassle, but it doesn't need to. And there's a couple of things that you can do that will help you avoid most problems. Here's a couple of helpful tips for you. Always be firm with the customer. Always operate from a high level of confidence. If you look or act unsure, you increase the possibility of the customer giving you grief. Also, always present a friendly attitude. You'll find that there's less chance of a negative reaction from a customer if you come across as a nice guy, one who's simply following policy and the law. 
And when you're faced with someone trying to purchase alcohol illegally, just simply tell them that you can't make the sale based on company policy and the law. And see, in that way, it's not you that's making the decision, it's the law and policy that's stopping the sale. Those make sense, and they're easy to remember, so uh, yeah, they'll help. Great. Now, handling alcohol sales requires that you keep your wits about you. Pay close attention during this shift for alcohol sales. We'll see what happens. Hi. Hi. Got anything else I can get for you today? Yeah, sure. Uh, can I get a pack of Marlboros in the box? Yeah. Need to see some identification, please. Yeah, sure. Here's my voter's registration card. I'm sorry, I can't accept that. Do you have anything else? No, I don't. The cops took my driver's license. Oh, can't you use this? It proves I'm over 21. No, I'm sorry, I can't. The law and company policy clearly state what I can accept as proof of age. Uh, should I ring up the rest of this for you? Forget it, man. If I can't get a lousy six-pack, who needs this junk? Well, that guy wasn't very happy. Yeah, well, he also probably wasn't 21. You have to be alert to kids that come up to the counter with a weird mix of products. I mean, look at this stuff. Who would come up to the counter with uh, a mix like this mm -hmm. unless he was trying to hide a six-pack? Hey, give me a hand putting the rest of this away, will you? Sure. Good evening. Hi. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good. Thanks. Can I see some identification, please? Are you serious? Yeah. Do you really think I'm under 21? Well, uh, company policy requires that I ask for identification from anyone who might be under 25. Well, that's really dumb. I mean, you only have to be 21 to buy beer. What's all this 25 stuff? Well, sometimes it's not always that easy to tell how old somebody is. So company policy says that I should ask for uh, identification. Okay. If you look like maybe you're under 25. Well. I still think it's done, but here's my state ID card okay, anyway. Okay, great. You don't have a driver's license? That's right. That's all I have, state ID. Okay. 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 Well, this seems just fine. Thank great. you. That's 458. Change right, ten. Thanks. thanks a lot. Did you see how easy that worked? Yeah, but I guess I don't know anyone that doesn't have a driver's license. <laughs> what was that book you used? Oh, this is the ID checking guide. It's great. It covers uh, information and driver's licenses from across the country, other forms of legal identification. Well, this is great. It's got everything in it. Yep. So whenever you're in doubt, you just uh, whip out the ID checking guide. Uh oh, look out! Here comes trouble. I need to get gas. Ten on uh, six. I'm sorry, sir, but uh, uh, I won't be able to sell you any gas this evening. Well, what do you mean, no gas? Well, policy forbids me from selling gasoline to anyone who's had too much to drink. Too much to drink? How do you know I had too much to drink? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but I cannot sell gas to anyone who, in my judgment, should not be driving. I'd be more than happy to call you a cab. A uh, cab? I don't need a cab. I've been driving since I was 16. That guy was really loaded. Yeah. Good thing we didn't turn him loose with a full tank of gas. Might have read about it tomorrow in the paper. Yeah, he might have killed himself or, or maybe even some innocent people. I never have thought of it that way. I'm glad he left somewhat quietly, though. Yeah, well, I got his license plate number. If he'd have given us any trouble, I'd have called the police. Knowing and obeying the law is vitally important in selling alcoholic beverages. Remember these key points. Whenever you have to refuse an alcohol sale, be firm, be confident, and also be friendly about it. Don't make the refusal a personal issue. Cite the law and company policy that requires the action. Underage people will frequently surround an alcohol purchase with a strange mix of unrelated products. Watch for this. Whenever you are in doubt about a strange ID, refer to the ID checking guide. And once again, remember, never sell alcohol or gasoline to anyone who, in your judgment, is intoxicated. It's the law. You've just seen two different issues relating to alcohol sales. Improper ID and an obviously intoxicated customer. There are others. For example, second party sales, altered IDs, and borrowed IDs. You'll learn about these issues and how to handle them by role playing. Now, complete checkpoint two in your participant's guide. 
When you complete this assignment, view the next segment of this video program. Now stop the video. Now, did you notice that every time I thought I was going to ask for ID, the very first thing I did was pull the alcohol towards me? That's very important. Okay, you must be in control of the product. If you think that you might not make the sale, immediately take the alcohol off the counter. Put it out of sight. This is proven to help diffuse the anger that customers may feel. If they don't see it anymore, they don't feel like it's theirs. All right? Now, we can't sell alcohol 24 hours a day. We're only allowed to sell alcohol during certain hours. All other times, the cooler doors are locked. I see. Now, anybody gives you any trouble about that, be polite, but tell them it's law. Now, Jeff, um, if you sell alcohol during restricted hours, you lose your job. And this store could lose its license. Something else, too, there's no drinking on the property. Now, wait a minute. Customers can buy alcoholic beverages here, but then they're not supposed to. No, they're not allowed to. They can't drink them here. They have to remove the sealed cans and bottles from the store, from the premises, before opening them. Again, that's the law. So even though they buy it here, they can't drink it in the store? Or on the premises. That means the whole entire property, inside and out. Again, that's another point where the law is very explicit. Knowing and obeying the law is vitally important in selling alcoholic beverages. Remember these key points. Whenever you are about to ask someone for an ID, first pull the beer or wine towards you. Refusal of an alcohol purchase requires that you take control of the situation immediately. First, remove the alcohol from the counter, then state the refusal. Alcohol can only be sold during certain hours. Keep the cooler doors locked when sales of beer and wine are not permitted. And never, ever sell alcohol during these restricted hours. Do not allow the drinking of alcohol anywhere on the property either inside or outside. Well, I think you're about ready to handle alcohol sales. When dealing with alcohol sales, if you have a question, ask your store manager. Now, complete checkpoint three in your participant's guide. When you finish the checkpoint, study the review sections for this module in your participant's guide. Keep in mind that you can go over the reviews as often as you like. When you're ready, you may take the module test. And remember, the module test counts. Now stop the video.